Hey guys, well thank you so much for tuning in to episode 5 of Behind the Music, honouring the past, learning for the future. I've had the honour of uh, interviewing so many incredible people throughout this, Graham Kendrick, Chris Bowater, so please feel free to check those out. But today it is my honour to interview one of my major musical influences in life, Dr Johnny Markin. Johnny and his family actually moved to Lincoln and as a young boy I used to have the opportunity to listen to Johnny play guitar week in week out and he is one of the main reasons as to why I do what I do today. So as part of that I want to honour Johnny today so sit back get a notebook out and get ready for this great interview with Dr Johnny Markin and right at the end going a little bit nostalgic I'm going to attempt to play one of Johnny's incredible 80s rock ballads, There You Are. It's a personal song to me, it's uh, helped through my journey. I remember as I was having chemotherapy, radiotherapy, I used to listen to this song. And then also on my wedding day, uh, the signing of the register, this song was also sung and played. So it's a special song to me, so wait till the end to hear my version of that. Well, fantastic. It is my huge honour and privileged now to be spending a little bit of time uh, with one of my personal heroes in the music and worship world. And uh, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a long time now. Uh, this mini series, Honouring the Past, uh, Learning for the Future, we've had some incredible interviews um, from the likes of Graham Kendrick, um, we've had Chris Bowater and uh, many other names. And I'm just really excited now that, to introduce my great friend, and I'm going to use your new title doctor hey, uh, Johnny Markin um, so there is a huge round of applause going on I'm sure <laughs> around the world right now um, but Johnny um, I, thank you so much for your time and uh, oh, David this is beautiful it's, the series has been fantastic to this point I just don't want to let the side down <laughs> no, no this is this is the peak this is this is the top now um and i'm really just encouraged you you're such an encouraging guy even just watching the series and um uh, matching my backdrop and putting all of your guitars up especially for this moment that was very kind of you to do that um but no this 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 really sums up what i'm trying to achieve um and we were just we were just laughing and talking about a few memories before we started this and um there's, there's been a number of, in, of moments in my life growing up where I knew, A, the call of God on my life to be a musician and be involved in worship. And it, it usually came by watching people and uh, kind of God bringing people into my life. And I was just sharing with you my reason for wanting to be in a, a worship leader was watching Bishop Joseph Garlington mm -hmm. um, on a VHS cassette where I just put it in and... I would rewind it all the time just watching him sing this song pass me not O gentle savior mm -hmm. in this incredible gospel voice and then i was uh, just mentioning to you my there was two reasons i i wanted to learn to play how to play guitar mm -hmm. and one was uh, kind of spiritual which was yourself and mm -hmm. the other was was non-spiritual which was the blockbuster hit back to the future and that moment when michael j fox picks up his guitar and plays johnny be good and the second thing is having Johnny Marking as the worship pastor at the church I was in was just like the most incredible thing because you were just the most phenomenal guitarist. And I used to listen to your album, No Frontiers, on repeat, and especially track 11 or 12, I think it is. Um, when you play the Four Seasons Spring, I would, I would be in my bedroom just imagining whether I could ever do that one day. And the truth is, I don't think I can. But I'm, <laughs> but at least I'm friends with the man who can. Um, oh man, I, you know I, I have to be honest. I hadn't played it in years, and I used to do it on an old Ibanez guitar, which yeah. was that Joe Satriani style guitar I had, yeah. and it had small frets and a whammy bar, and you could do all that stuff. And I, just playing around about a year ago in the house, and Darlene said, "Hey, can you still play the Four Seasons?" So I tried it, and I got to the middle part where I was doing the two-handed stuff down the fretboard, <laughs> and I got a cramp. I was like, ah. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. And uh, th there's a great interesting little little link there with obviously mm -hmm. me watching Michael J. Fox play guitar and obviously then being in a church on a Sunday and being inspired. And then to find out there's a great little connection there, isn't there? Well, yeah, back when I was growing up, 
we lived in an apartment block uh, for about a year. And this kid moved to our neighborhood. It was Mike Fox. And he was wow. living in the apartment block. And he sat in front of me. And uh, to be honest, he was, you know, he's not a, a great stature, but neither am I. And it was like, we were, that kind of got on well together and we were neighbors and he saw me playing guitar. I had just started strumming a few chords. My brother was showing me how to play. He saw that, came over one day and said, can you teach me how to play guitar? I'll, I'll pay you. I'll, you know, I said, I don't know, what do you charge? So for a nickel, a lesson, I was showing Mike some chords and uh, I moved away shortly after that, a few months later. And uh, one day I turned on the TV and he was on a sitcom and a little later, there he is playing Johnny B. Good, the movie. And I'm going, wow, the journey began in our humble little apartment. That is an incredible story. <laughs> so let's let's dive uh, right in, because sure. I think we could we could probably chat for hours um, about all things. But um, what would be great to hear for anybody who's watching this? Um, we want to be honoring to those that have. Uh, have made an incredible way for the likes of me and people who are up and coming uh, musicians to have a go and um, to be in this worship world. Um, I would love to hear a bit of your life story, really. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe could could you start with kind of your upbringing and where the passion for music first came, and then maybe bring us up to the point where you felt the call of God on your life to to be um, a musician and in ministry. Yeah, you know, David, I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, our, we weren't a church going family. And so sometime in my late teens, I'd always had a sense that somehow I needed to connect with God. My mom had a Bible on the shelf. I would pull it out when I was 10 years old and read this King James Bible. And I was expecting something, but I was like, oh, I can't understand this. And, you know, when you think about how God superintends your life when he's called you to himself. You know, years later, a few years later, I'm playing in a, a little garage rock band with my buddy down the street. His older brother finds Jesus on when he's backpacking across Europe. He comes back and he, he needs to share with his little brother and all his little brother's friends. He sits us down and tells us about Jesus, gives us a track. And, you know, methodology changes over the years. However, he was communicating most important thing was that when he explained the gospel, the Holy Spirit did something in my heart. And it's like the light went on. And I knew I wanted to follow this Jesus. And it took a few years to work through actually what that would mean in terms of following Jesus. And uh, so when I was 17, I was playing in a rock band. Uh, at high school, we had a management company and we were a truck, PA lights. And we were touring around the province as a, you know, like a final year of high school. And um, God got a hold of me. and and just called me to himself and said, I have different purpose for you. Wow. And uh, I had been listening to people like Larry Norman, Randy Stonehill, Phil Keggy, these early Christian rock artists. And I thought, you know what? I really resonate with what they're saying. And that music spoke to me, brought me to Jesus. Maybe I could do a bit of that. And that's when my writing actually began, my songwriting. I finally had something to say. And I wanted to be able to communicate Jesus to my peers. So I got playing in some Christian bands along the way. I, I Put the uh, the secular music career and dreams aside, and Jesus, wherever you want to use me, it's fine. So I, it's it's been a great journey since uh, about the late 70s, 79 or so, right after high school, started playing and remember joining up with some buddies, uh, and begin touring England with a group called Titus. Yeah, and uh, those were those were fun years. Got to know all of our great dear friends in Lincoln and throughout the UK, and uh, that. Um, I guess that's pretty much how I came to be in Christian music, but it was in Lincoln where your dad, Stuart, and Chris Bowater really saw something in what I was doing and said, you know, God's got his hand on you for leading the church in worship, and I was kind of taken aback and said, really? Oh, okay, and you know, like they spoke that into my life, and it was a really, it was a challenge but the Holy Spirit cultivated it, I think. And, uh, you know, I found that, yeah, as I began to lead the people of God in praise, it was a really fulfilling thing to do to serve the body of Christ in that way. And that's what I've been doing now for the last 20 something years. That's amazing. So you mentioned uh, the rock stage, and this was mm -hmm. what I was um, probably alluding to earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. And for me being a kind of a small boy, just kind of uh, admiring and, um, and, and looking up really, um, 
what's so incredible is probably that album that you've maybe forgotten about now, the No Frontiers <laughs> album, which is one of my top five favorite albums of all time. Oh wow! And um, and uh, Sarah and I, uh, we we loved a song on that album. So when we we were dating and things like that, I used to I used to play it in in the car and uh, you know those type of things. And uh, and then we actually when we got married, um, we had that as our signing the register song from your no frontiers album and uh it was amazing to just link that back to obviously our wedding day one of the most mm. uh, amazing days in my life and uh and that song was was there playing and we had dave bainbridge uh playing the guitar song oh wow um, oh uh, that, wow that song uh, he almost did it as good as you not quite but almost <laughs> he's amazing yeah <laughs> so, you, you know it, David, the, the interesting thing about the song is I was just telling you, I probably, after recording the song, never played it live. And it, it has sat dormant all those years. But the fact that it spoke to you in those days is really meaningful for me to hear. And I know that you, you had a, your health challenges in those days, too. And it was hopefully a really uh, encouragement in those days, yeah, too. It's, it, it was actually going back to that time. That's, that's really reminded me. That's probably one of the reasons why why that song stuck around for me mm -hmm. um, in the sense that the chorus, you know, there you are holding my heart, you know, calming the fear that unsettles me, you know, right. um, there you are stirring my soul, bringing a song in this silence. You're impressed now that I've remembered all oh, the lyrics. So. I, can't, I, can't, I can't remember the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I probably can't go further than there, but, but, but that just, you know, that, that epic melody and that kind of just being a young boy and, and going through all of that stuff, which, which many people would be aware of. But yeah, that, that song, whether you just wrote it and didn't play it again, it, it's had, um, it's had huge, huge impact on my life. And, uh, it was nice to experience that song through a, uh, walking through hell and back to receive healing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was also nice hearing that song on my wedding day, one of the best days of my wow. life. So. Wow, that's amazing. The, the album actually was written in a time where I was actually walking through a crisis of faith. Wow. And, uh, you know, not growing up in the church, I don't think I had deep roots about a lot of things. I was just taking on, you know, what the faith was from a lot of people. And I can remember having to do college debates, you know, when I was touring with YSC and, and stuff like and thinking, you know, what, what if all of this isn't right? And, and literally, you know, the, the current cool word in evangelicalism is deconstructing their faith which is just kind of a, a term for I'm abandoning the faith. And I'm going to make it up myself. Sure. I actually went through a deconstruction period where I just questioned the doctrines around the faith. And it's not that I stopped believing in God, but I was like, well, what if we didn't get it right? What? But then actually going and exploring it, it came back to who Jesus was. Sure. Who did he say he was? And, and, and if he rose from the dead, then everything else can flow easily out of all of those things and rebuilt into you know the historic confessing faith that we know in things like yeah. the apostles creed yeah bring us to the time then obviously you you were touring um talk to talk about the move to lincoln uh bringing mm. the family here and then obviously becoming worship pastor of what was known as new life church now oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the yeah. life church yeah t tell us a little bit about that uh, we had been touring and living over at the Youth for Christ headquarters in near Budley in um, Shropshire. I think it was part of Shropshire. We had Bray Mortimer, I believe, was the village we lived in. Nice. And uh, we just felt we needed some roots. And we were at spring harvest one year and just feeling ragged and drawn out. And we'd been in the UK resident for nearly four years, and we were about to get our residency papers to be able to stay indefinitely and we thought we need a place to move to and uh, we ran into Chris and his family Chris Bowater and the family they're all staying in the chalet and he came up to Darlene and I and you know in that fatherly manner that Chris has he put his arms around us and he said you need a place where you can have a church care for you when you're traveling help you when you're at home and just be your family and we just realized that Lincoln was where we had to go. Another buddy, Andy Harrington, who actually now lives over here as well and has been doing ministry here for 20 something years. Uh, he was the Youth for Christ director at the time. And he says, yeah, Johnny, you should come to Lincoln. The house is not very expensive and, and you'd be able to afford one. And, uh, oh, okay. So we did. But I mean, obviously it was, we already knew so many people through New Life and Lincoln Christian Fellowship. 
you know, it, it was just an easy time to move over and just instantly have community. And it became so important for us because our families were all the way back here, you know, 10 hour flight away, eight hour time zone away. And that having that church family around us was so important when we went through a couple of crises in life. And uh, uh, I mean, we have such a fondness for Lincoln. A little story three years ago, we took a team from Trinity Western University over to be on tour with um, Rent Collective. It's yep. an opportunity. We trained up a team, went, went on tour, and we brought them to Lincoln because yep. we were going to do something in the area. And it was a beautiful, sunny afternoon. And I walked out. The, the, we got to stay in the White Park Hotel. It was beautiful. Right. And walked out, you know, uphill and just saw the cathedral and the castle and looked up against the blue sky. And I have missed this city. Yeah. And just the people and just how formative it was for our lives and what God did in us and through us. And, it, you know, we just can't wait for the pandemic to be over to come back to the UK and, and see everybody and ah, just get stuck in again. Absolutely. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about songwriting and obviously mm -hmm. bringing, uh, bring is, bringing us up in the story when you moved to Lincoln. Um, talk to us a little bit about how the songwriting changed to you becoming more of a, a, a worship leader and, and worship songwriter. Um, tell us a little bit about, about that journey. You know, mid '90s, I had been well. Early '90s, I started writing some worship songs for the youth praise events we were doing with Spring Harvest and at Grapevine. And um, people like ICC were saying, "Why don't you do an album of some of these?" You know, like so we we did. We recorded it in Chris Bowater's house. Dan Bowater engineered it. Chris had been on holiday, and their studio wasn't built yet. So it's use my house. So we moved the console into the front room. And, Put the drums in the dining room and the vocal mics and we recorded it there but it was an exploration for me of going back to roots doing an acoustic worship album in that season when everybody was doing a lot of acoustic stuff and it taught me that the song itself is really really important that what you have to sing and what you have to say becomes the essence of the song and it was a really good exercise adrian thompson at the time was helping me refine the songs andy piercy was a great help in learning how to refine songs and know how to just have you don't want any filler. You just want thrilling. <laughs> you know, don't have any throwaway lines, you know. Uh, so it was a good challenge. It was tough work. And uh, there is an adage that people have often said that great songs aren't written, they're rewritten. And I've rewritten a lot of my material. And in fact, you and I have been working on a song for my newest album, which is a complete rewrite from where it began. And I was just so thrilled with the creative uh, side that you brought to things. You you looked at this lyric and and I was hearing it one way and you and you sang it and I went, that is what it has to be. I'm gonna be and honest, we, I, oh. I felt the pressure in that moment. I was like, this is <laughs> my, this is my first opportunity to write with one of the legends and uh, oh. you, you play me this song in six different versions and then said, yes, okay, what would you do? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank, thankfully I had a moment of inspiration and sang something oh. out and you liked it. So that was good. Oh, that's been great. And uh, the song is, is beautiful. Steve Thompson down in London has been doing some of the tracking on it. And he's just painted this beautiful canvas behind the song. So you and I are going to be able to work on that together for the upcoming release. That's amazing. So we, we've had you in Lincoln and, and those type of things and loads of familiar songs to everybody that's listening. Lord of Hosts, um, mm -hmm. an anthem really in the life of the church yeah. um, that, that we actually still do to this day. I can remember probably... <laughs> probably emailing you maybe a year ago saying, hey, John, yeah. do, you have, do you have the chord chart for? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to do it on Sunday. Um, it's, it's the only song that uh, I've ever played where you get a little bit excited to play a song on an acoustic guitar. So, uh, <laughs> so well done for doing that. Thanks, um, man. But then obviously, sadly for us, but obviously great for you, a new opportunity and um, back mm -hmm. in Canada. So so bring us kind of from that moment of, of leaving Lincoln through to a bit more current day, because um, you're involved in so many uh, fun and amazing right. things. So take right. us there. You know, in late 99, um, my father-in-law was getting quite ill. He had diabetes and he'd had some heart surgeries. And Darlene was getting very, very worried about that. And my parents came to visit in that period as well. And when they were out, just watching them with their grandkids, with our kids, Daniel and Jennifer, uh, it was an experience that I didn't have growing up. I didn't have grandparents near me. And there was just this pulling 
both in Darlene and I that your time here has has it's being finished for now. We didn't think it would be our last time to the UK, but it's like we, we need you over here for now. And I got contacted by a church uh, in the city of Abbotsford, which is 30 minutes, 40 minutes from where I grew up in, you know, closer to Vancouver. And this is out in what we call the Fraser Valley. And uh, we connected with each other and it was a really great fit to land because they were embracing a lot of the new music that was coming out of the UK. And here's this guy living in the UK who's part of the, the worship scene over there. And uh, why don't you come and do this? And it was just an easy, the, the church was so alike uh, New Life Church in the day with the way the teams were set up, the kind of emphases that were going on. Uh, it was just an easy transplant. And we stuck in there, watched the kids be raised there. And uh, over the years, learned about the replication that's necessary as a pastor. You know, Ephesians 4 tells us we're to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Mm -hmm. And so we built up this discipleship track uh, in our music ministries, where we actually had a kids band playing for the, the you know, up to 10 year olds. And they would do songs that we were writing, or, you know, which was exciting. Yeah. Uh, then we had the youth, the middle school youth band, and then the high school youth band. And then we had the young adults band. And the, But it got to the point where we were discipling them in the faith as much as discipling them in music. And we could call on any of those age groups we, we had 10 year old play drums one time we had 16 year olds regularly on the team and their maturity level because we were trying to help them understand a biblical view of worship you know mm -hmm. here's the faith here's why we sing you know like all of these things we wanted to talk about and that passion for teaching about worship continued to grow and back about you know, seven or eight years ago i went to grad school and i I got my master's in worship studies at the Robert Weber Institute. And then that, uh, when an opportunity came up to be teaching at the local university and uh, sharing time with the church, they said, why don't you go get your doctorate too? So just a year or so ago, I finished up my doctorate at the Weber Institute. And that has been so rewarding to be able to connect with people worldwide because it's a global school and they, everybody comes to Florida for these, these classes. And we go home and we, we look at our own church and the material and we, make sure we enculturate everything properly. It, it's, it's really been a beautiful season to find that the body of Christ is so diverse and so multicultural and, and, and Jesus loves his bride. It's amazing. That's so incredible. Um, it's, it's really inspiring um, to hear you, all of these further studies happening. Um, I'd love to ask two questions really uh they're quite yeah. i think they're probably quite big questions so um mm -hmm. um to do first to do with songwriting um and sure. this was this was one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this series that was that i love to honor you know the past um mm -hmm. and honor those songwriters that have gone before but also there's a uh, some of these songs that we're talking about have have been around 30 40 you know 50 years mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and has still been sung and have, have stood the test of time and one thing I'm constantly hearing from when I spoke to Graham Kendrick, Chris Bowater, Jared Cooper is they were all solidly connected and invested in local church. And most of their songs were born out of them just taking notes during the sermons and the preaches and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, spending time with God. And it was it was almost like it was it was a calling on their life rather than a, a career. And uh, I suppose songwriting now it's 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 a career um for so many people um mm -hmm. so what would your advice be to christian songwriters worship pastors like myself have you got any things that you've noticed in the change mm -hmm. in culture um maybe the change of of how we're writing the content the lyrics those type of things is there anything that you you would advise us with um in our songwriting uh for the future yeah, the two things that come to mind, and, and very briefly, one of the ones we have to continue to remember is singability. Uh, we, if we want people to participate, we have to remember that those of us who perform from the front, and I use that word very, you know, ease, not, you know, not the word like we're performing, but very loosely, um, we are usually better vocalists than the congregants. And so we do things with our voice that we expect everybody to be able to do. They can't necessarily. Timing melody, range, uh, all of those things. Uh, so it's, it's helped me to realize that when I write songs, I wanna make them 
accessible musically so that they're singable, even just watch out for too many words, watch out for syllables that are cramped, watch out for too many accents and little things like that. Uh, in one sense, it'll make it a little bit stilted and wooden. And there's, so you gotta find the balance where it still sounds musical, but is still approachable for the average singer. When it comes to content, I think the church is um, having to look at a couple of things. Just today, I was working on a blog that'll be going up on my site about the, the amount of me songs that we use in worship. And I call it anthropocentric worship is we make what goes on in worship all about me. Mm. You know, and, and I use the example that, you know, Jesus did this for me. And, and, and that's good. It's great. We testify to the goodness of God. But what happens is that we have this predominance of just songs that are about my spiritual experience. And we actually, if somebody walked in, would they identify who we're talking about? And what would they take away about the character of God and about the church and about our hope? If all we did is sing about what God has done for me. Now, sure. scripture is full of things where the people of God tell, they testify to what God has done. The Psalms, the Old Testament, even things, songs written in the New Testament. We, this is what God has done. But there's songs that we need to write too about who God is. This is who he is. This is who we are in relation to him. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And so we need to sing about God. We need to sing um, to God in a vertical manner. And we also need to sing in a horizontal manner because Paul tells us to sing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs yeah. so that we build up each other in the faith. Yeah. And so that's an important thing is this tripartite, this three-way conversation going on that, that is, is beautiful. And yeah. we have to remember God is speaking to songs, scripture, when the church gathers, the preaching, God is speaking to us. We are speaking to him. We are speaking to one another. So what songs can we, re can we write uh, that are both singable, but also convey who our God is and who we are in him? That's an amazing answer. That's, that's really helpful. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I suppose we've, we've been in an interesting time, haven't we, when it comes yeah. to worship. Um, I've, I've actually quite enjoyed some of it. Uh, I, I don't know about yourself, but... Um, uh, you're right. There's no greater feeling when you feel the call of God on your life to lead worship and you've got people in a building, the church. Yeah. And yeah. Um, as you say, as Paul says, to sing to one another with I'm, I'm a big fan. I try and teach our worship leaders and musicians as much as I can. Keep your eyes open, you know. The, yeah, good, good. Just so from a, a practical aspect, you know, you can communicate with the band. We know where everyone's going. And then also you want to see what the people you, you know, you want to build a relationship, those type of things. And sometimes when we close our eyes nonstop in worship, it becomes a little bit about my own personal experience and I, I've lost the job of leading worship. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I, I've, I've, there's no greater feeling, is there, when you have yeah. the anthem of praise where um, melodies yeah. and harmonies come together in a church mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. And um, that's amazing. But also there's been this incredible thing that we've had to adapt to in this um pandemic where most of us have been yeah. in our own little rooms like this mm -hmm. staring at a computer screen singing hoping that yeah. kind of people are on the other end of it and uh, those type of things and i i think i'm going to look back and and find those moments quite special and quite sacred because um i i, I suppose for, for a number of different reasons it's allowed me to actually worship uh which is great because uh I'm not uh, a too too worried about what the band are doing. Uh, I'm not uh, trying to tell the PA guy I need a change. Uh, the words aren't coming up in time for me to sing because I didn't learn them. And uh, it kind of, you know, all all of those things have been taken out, so I can kind of just be kind of free to to worship, mm. which has been very exciting and also a great thing for us as a family. And you probably have had this for years. You know, when you take your family to church. Uh, you kind of usually leave them on the first or second row because your job is to yeah. to be on the platform. And so yeah. actually for us, you know, when we've been doing pre-recorded worship and coming together and worshiping as a family, it's been a, it's been an amazing experience to be able to That's stand great. in front of a TV as strange and weird as that is, but to worship, yeah. you know, as a, as a family. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's, going to be some amazing memories I remember from this and obviously some things I'm yeah. really longing to get back to. But as we um, 
to move out of this pandemic um, and we start to gather again, we start to worship. I know it'll feel and look different. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts for worship moving forward? What do we need to um, regain and what do we need to lose from what we did before? I think the temptation when we do pre-recorded stuff is that we set this bar of, you know, like when you're in the recording studio, you've got to, you've got to make sure you play it right. You've got to sing it right. You go back, you retake, you retake. We have to get used again to the idea that it's not the performance that's most important when we're gathered here with our music. It's the facilitation of the saints to do just what you're talking about, to sing out and to engage with God in, in the great themes of the faith and, and to give him his praise vocally. So I think we're going to have to just pull back a little bit on our presentational expectations of ourselves. Uh, I, I like your honesty when you're talking about, you know, the words aren't coming up and, and you know, what's the band doing? There's these distractions that go on. And I, I think if we can learn, and it's a discipline for me every time I lead, let's keep the main thing the main thing. What am I singing in this moment right here? How can I be in the moment to make sure that I'm a praiser first, a worshiper first, and a facilitator at the same time, but as a no, not as a greater importance, you know, those hats we wear are really, really a challenge. And, and I really respect how you've learned how to wear that in a beautiful way. Uh, you, uh, you can't say enough about the, just the maturity I've seen in you in these years. It's, it's really, it's exciting. But that's one thing I think the church will have to guard against is that overproduced sense of expectation yeah. that we have to have because people are just gonna love being back together. Mm -hmm. I know that there are some churches who have begun simply with an acoustic guitar again sure. or a piano. And it's just that sense of learning, getting people to learn to find their voice again in the company yeah. of other people. Uh, I went to, attended a service where it was like a drive-in thing and there was a few uh, people in the parking lot just this past Sunday. And just, I had the windows down and to hear the people singing along. Yeah. Uh, again, it was, oh my goodness, how I have missed the sound of the saints. And I just, I think in terms of that picture in Revelation 4, Revelation 5, when all of creation is gathered at the throne of God and of the Lamb, and they are singing his praises, and they are saying these things, that vocal expression of praise, you know, yeah. that's where it begins. That's where it comes from. And it's going on all the time. We get to join in with that. And I think if we can get a vision for that, the song will come. That's amazing. Well, I, th I think our, our time is, is kind of nearly nearly through. Maybe one final question. What what do you feel the future is um, for the Markin family? Uh, oh. What what's the what's the next steps? What's the because I would love to be able to finish just with praying for you. Um, oh. So talk talk to me about some of your dreams and hopes for future. The two projects that I'm working on right now. One is uh, this new album I'm I'm doing after many many years, and I'm excited about that. That's the artistic side of me, but it's also a chance to sing the faith again. It, it's all rooted in ancient liturgy and, and the texts of scripture. And I'm brought up to date with, you know, as, as much as my musical boomer age era will, will allow me to do, you know. Uh, but uh, hopefully it'll resonate with people and, and that'll be exciting and pass on something of uh, a legacy that way. But uh, the other is just the continuing to help churches with developing their worship programs. I launched something called Worship Leader Institute and uh, we're trying to mentor worship leaders, help them with their teams, help churches in processes where they're saying, hey, we have to find a new worship pastor. And, and part of my role is to say, let's take one step back. What kind of a person you need to hire is based on what, what is your theology and philosophy of the gathering of worship? Now, how do you know who you got? I mean, you could just go get a great musician for sure. But do you know, what, what are your priorities when you gather? How can that person help facilitate that? So I think that training principle is, is, it's got me excited. So I'm doing blogs and interviews and putting those up on there too. And then there's some curriculum I'd love to teach uh, that I have been teaching to in doing some of these little schools and uh, look forward to that in the future as the pandemic uh, comes to a close. I mean, Zoom is great, don't get me wrong, but people spend all day working on Zoom. I don't wanna teach on Zoom to them any more than I have to. Yeah, um, I agree. But it, yeah. as far as the family goes, uh, Darlene and I are empty nesters. Uh, Daniel, uh, our oldest, is now 27. He's right. married. He lives downtown Vancouver, and he is a pastor at Westside Church. And we're very proud of him. He is finishing up his Master of Divinity degree very shortly, in the next weeks or so. Right. And uh, our daughter, Jennifer, 
is married to a fine young American boy, and they live in the U.S. of A. Uh, down in Columbus, Ohio. And we miss them desperately. Uh, it's been over a year, a year and a half since we've been able to physically be with them. And uh, wow. that would be a dream to be together again once the pandemic passes. Um, so we would love to be able to continue to do ministry as the Lord asks of us, whether that's locally here, nationally, regionally, or internationally, and rekindling some of our uh, partnerships with people like yourself in the United Kingdom. I, I would love and be honored to pray for you if that's okay, Johnny. Absolutely, you. please do. Father God, I just thank you uh, so much. We always start uh, by thanking you for everything you've done for us, Father. I thank you for the gift of relationship, um, especially in your church that um, spans across uh, oceans, uh, timelines, and I just thank you for this incredible gifted family. I thank you for Johnny and Darlene for the call of God upon their life. I thank you uh, from more of a selfish point of view that you brought them into our lives and the impact that they have had, but not only that, but around the world, Father. I thank you for the gifting and talents you've placed upon uh, Johnny, and I thank you for every area that he's involved in now, Father. I pray that your hand of blessing will be on it. I pray that you would guide his steps, ordain his steps for the future. I pray that he, you would open doors for him um, that are just so clear, Father. I pray that this next season will be a peaceful season in his ministry. I pray that uh, you'll bring divine connections, divine appointments right into his life, Father. And we just thank you for everything this couple does and this family does. And I pray as this uh, pandemic ceases that loved ones will be reunited uh, together and spend um, a special time together, Father. But um, I just pray now that uh, the future, uh, Johnny, I just really believe is is wide open, it's bright, um, it's exciting, it's another adventure. And uh, I'm just excited to see what unfolds um, in, the, in the years and days ahead uh, for you and Darlene and just uh, just honoured and grateful that you're a part of our lives. So we pray blessing, protection on you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, thank Johnny, you, thank David. you so much for being uh, a guest on here and uh, just honoured by your time and I can't wait uh, to hang out in, uh, hopefully in Lincoln. That'd be great. That'd be so great. This world is taking all my strength from me When my feelings grow so dark that I can't see yeah. When I'm shaking in the corner with my tears I look for you When my strength seems to tear my faith in two and when loneliness turns every feeling blue when I'm desperate to find the right way through I look for you there you are holding my heart Soul, bring it 
I'm